Hey there folks, Bob Yeager here. Welcome to One Foot in the Wild. So um, I had some questions, uh, quite a few questions in a couple of my groups, um, a couple of my forums and um, emails and things over the past few months. And I want to kind of address them. And that is uh, the truth about homesteading. Now, keep in mind, I'm not an off-grid homesteader. I, I use fuel, um, which most homesteaders have to anyway. Um, I'm on the electrical grid. I have an internet connection. Um, I don't pay for water, uh, sewage, or anything like that. I have my own well that is a deep well system into an underground river. We have natural springs on the property. I have a septic system and a drain field. Um, so I don't have all that. Um, I don't have natural gas or anything like that. It's all electric. Uh, so I can easily transition to uh, backup generators, solar power, things like that. The thing is, is in Pennsylvania, we get on average, um, a lot of people don't know this, is um, 80 full days of sunshine per year. So solar is a hit or miss thing here. You have to have a lot of battery banks and a lot of solar panels. And quite honestly, I can't justify the expense uh, to run our entire home off of solar all the time, considering we have pretty long winters, five to six months. Um, skies are mostly gray and um, it just wouldn't be feasible for us. Plus we have a lot of shade trees around our home and uh, it would take a lot of work and a lot of things I wouldn't want to do to transition to that. Now, as far as our shop goes, this is something I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, my barn with the chicken coop on it, um, I could put solar on there and I may at some point for certain things. Uh, but once again, uh, for the types of things I do like welding and things like that, it wouldn't be really feasible for me uh, to just go with solar power. Um, but the truth is, uh, a lot of people don't realize, even though I was raised towards the city of Pittsburgh, my parents were homesteaders in their own right. They were caretakers of cemetery. They grew their own food. They hunted their own food. Um, a lot of the things that my mom did, um, she made us clothes a lot when I was a kid, um, but they weren't off-grid either. My dad was raised on a, a farm in Waynesburg, PA, like way, way, way back in Bucktown, way back in the hills. And they were homesteaders. Um, my family that came here from Germany, um, when my great grandfather, my grandfather, and uh, all them, his brothers and sisters came here, they're homesteaders. It's, it's, it's the life they've always lived. So for us, we didn't call it homesteading. It's just the way we lived. Um, but let's talk about the truth of the matter. Um, the initial investment into homesteading can be quite expensive depending upon what you're going to do. Um, for those of you looking for land, these, here's some just quick tips that I could, I could give you right out the gate. Um, for one, don't, get, don't build too much house and don't get too much land. Land is a lot of work to maintain. It's a lot of work to uh, make it into what you want it to be. And what you want to do is you want to grow with your land. You're not going to do it all at once. Don't rush the process. Uh, it takes quite some time to make um, a par parcel of, especially raw land, into a livable homestead. Um, it can be done. It's just a lot of work. So if you have a regular nine to five job, and you think you're going to go out homesteading on a uh, raw track of land that's 50, 100 acres, you're insane. It, you'll wear, you'll burn yourself out, and you'll hate every minute of it. Um, what you want to do is start now towards getting certain tools that you need to have in place. Tools like axes. Um, I use splitting mauls and wedges and a small electric log splitter more than anything when I'm chopping all this firewood and everything that I'm doing here. Uh, I use a chainsaw to cut it. But I do have manual saws. I do have splitting wedges and splitting mauls and axes and those types of things. Generally, if I'm cutting stumps like this and splitting, I'm not using an ax, I'm using a maul and a wedge uh, to bust them in two. And then usually I'm gonna throw them over on the little electric log splitter. It takes longer to split it on that than it does for me with a maul, but I'm not physically exerting myself as much as I would be if I was splitting it all with a maul. Um, my neighbor next door, he uses a chopper one x um, i gave him one as well a newer one uh, that has the little gear things on it and he splits those things like crazy um, but you gotta understand that he's extremely physically fit um, and that's an, another takeaway um, 
physical fitness. Now, keep in mind, I keep tractors around. I have a Ford 1100 that I use for like tilling and pushing with a, a front blade attachment, um, hauling heavy things around with it. I have uh, a 96 Blazer and a Land Rover that I use as tractors all the time. I use it to pull stuff and I've, I've used them to pull trees down, all kinds of stuff. Um, I have a John Deere 425. Um, I have a John Deere 165 Hydro, which is just a little backup mower that we keep around. And I have the Cup Cadet commercial mower um, that I use most more times than not. That's the thing with the utility cart on it. And that's, that's a key thing, man. Uh, utility carts and wheelbarrows are extremely important. Um, most of the time I'm going to use the tractor with the utility cart. Uh, why? Because I have to, when I'm doing projects, I'm going all over the place. I keep my tools, most of my, all of my outdoor tools in the barn here, and all of my hand tools and woodworking tools and mechanics tools and everything I actually keep in the house, uh, simply because they'd, they'd rust sitting in the barn. Uh, so I keep them in the house in a more controlled environment. And I always have a toolbox in the cart as I'm pulling it around uh, with basic mechanic tools and yard tools. Why? Well, because you always come across something that needs done. That tree needs cut up, this or that. Uh, but you're driving a machine around and sometimes you need mechanics tools because something breaks or you got to pull apart and go to the parts store and you can't get the machine back to your house so you got to repair it in the field. Those are things I think about. Same in my trucks. All of my trucks have toolboxes in them. Um, that have the tools that it would take to fix anything on those trucks except for you know major transmission overhauls and things like that obviously right um, I always keep spare parts around this is a big part of home studying spare parts for everything spare parts for my vehicles for my machines for my tools my gas powered tools for uh, home repairs uh, extra electrical outlets extra light switches extra light fixtures um, parts parts are the thing that most people don't think about in home studying a lot of times if you are actually home studying there's a good chance that you're not real close to a place where you can conveniently get a lot of those things so you'd have to order for like amazon or drive a couple hours away um, luckily i can drive about 20 minutes 30 minutes and find pretty much everything i really need but when the lockdown came around uh, none of those places were open they were all shut down uh, luckily, I keep spare everything around. I mean, I even keep spare batteries around and keep them on like a little Jake charger, like a little trickle charger, um, battery conditioner. Uh, because, no, well, the batteries freeze in the wintertime a lot of time on these machines if you forget about them, and sometimes they crack and you got to replace them. So, there's all these different things you really have to think about. So, what I would suggest is you create a checklist. If you're planning to homestead or you're just getting started or you bought that piece of land, you're like, man, I'd really like to build myself a small little cabin on that piece of land. Um, start with a checklist, home repair tools, construction tools, and that's like carpentry and things like that, electrical repair tools, mechanical tools, and gardening and yard tools, okay? Then on top of that, you wanna put a list for conveyance. Um, having a pickup truck or an SUV with a trailer on the back is really great. Um, I opt for the SUVs with the trailers. I've owned plenty of pickup trucks and quite honestly, I love a big four-wheel drive off-road SUV that I could just pop a trailer onto the back to and um, I can leave that trailer set if I'm doing some camping or outings and things like that or if I'm working far out on the property. I can load that thing up with all my construction tools and everything that I need. I can take it out there, I can set it there, but I still got my vehicle to use. It's not overloaded with everything and all of my stuff is under lock and key within those trailers, okay? Um, buildings. Uh, I'm building a latrine about four acres back uh, that's for when I'm teaching my wilderness classes and stuff. I have an outbuilding here, which is an old horse stable, actually. It's a huge barn. Uh, it's not as big as some barns out there, but hey. Um, there's a hen house that I just built. Um, and we have a couple storage sheds uh, located on the property. Outbuildings are important. Even over by the pool over here, we have a, um, a pump house that's specifically for pool tools, you know, cleaning agents, uh, the pump keeping everything undercover and keeping everything locked up um, and keeping everything safe. So 
the all of these things are things that you have to consider in the grand scheme of things. The other thing is is emergency cash on hand. Um, small bills. Uh, keep a lot of small bills around and keep um, a stockpile of gold or silver around. I'd say silver, actually. A lot of people are like, well, invest in gold. It's not about investing. It's about protecting the buying power of your dollars. Also, it's about saving in a way where the banks aren't in control of your savings account. Silver has grown quite a bit in the past year, um, but it always keeps at least the, you know, the, the buying power of your dollar in check. Um, and it's easy to exchange. It's easy to go to a pawn shop or uh, go online to like Provident Metals or something like that, and they'll buy it back from you. Um, so it's pretty simple. So I just get silver rounds, one ounce silver rounds. Um, I have a lot. Like it's a ridiculous amount, but I didn't buy them all at once. I bought them over the years, just like my tools. Many of my old hand woodworking tools I bought from eBay, I got from thrift shops, I got at flea markets, I got at yard sales, and quite a few of them were my great grandfather's, and he gave them to my grandfather, and he gave them to my dad, and you know, we just save that stuff. If I see estate sales, and they say uh, woodworking tools, uh, old woodworking tools, I go and look, and a lot of times I can pick up, you know, Stanley number four planes for a few bucks, like five or six bucks. Um, the old distant saws. I'll, I'll tell you, those old steel hand saws are going to last outlast your circular saw. <laughs> um, but when it gets into things like power tools and stuff, don't be a, think that because you're homesteading that you have to do all this, you know, pioneering style of everything. I use hand tools a lot because I like doing it. I enjoy the nostalgia of it. I enjoy the quiet, the silence of it, uh, not hearing motors running and saw blades turning. I really like that. But when I got to get the job done, and it's I'm pulling out the circular saw, a hand saw, um, sometimes my air compressor, and I keep a little portable air compressor, and that thing can be used for all kinds of things. So on your property, if you have water lines and things like that, sometimes you got to blow them out in the winter time if you're not using some of your gardening lines and things. You got to blow them out so they don't freeze. So you can put a little bib on one of the water lines, close them all down, and blast air through there and it'll clear out your water lines so they don't freeze up in the winter time. Nothing like doing pipe repair in the middle of winter. It sucks, right? Uh, but that comes down to another thing, plumbing. Make sure you have a toolkit that's specifically based on plumbing. Plumbing is the water on your property. The, um, the water system, maybe you have a rain catchment system. It's your toilet, it's your sink, it's whatever you have that's got water running through it or sewage running through it. Uh, having a basic knowledge and understanding of repairing plumbing and um, installing plumbing fixtures like toilets and showers and things like that is really important. When I was a kid, we didn't hire anybody to do the work. We were the caretakers of the grounds, but we were also the stewards of the, the house itself. Um, so we repaired everything ourselves. We did drywall ourselves. We did the wiring ourselves. We did plumbing ourselves. Um, the only thing we wouldn't do was natural gas hookups and stuff. We call a gas company to do that kind of stuff. Uh, but other than that, it was us. We did all that. Uh, we'd call the guy to come and honey dip the septic tank or whatever. You know, all those different things. Uh, if repairs needed to be done, we just, you learned how to do it. Well, here's the thing. When you're home studying, you are that person. You're the person that repairs everything many of the times. Um, if you have a stack of cash and you want to go hire somebody to do a bunch of stuff for you, I don't have a problem with you hiring people to do stuff with you. I think it's fine. In this day, to, day and age, find somebody local to you that's a really good handyman or guy or girl and pay them to do stuff for you, right? But at the end of the day, don't think that you have to be... Um, highly skilled at everything you got to be good enough you got to be a jack of all trades not a master of anything um, and you figure it out as you go um, finally food folks let me tell you until your your soils conditioned properly gardening can be hard um, I planted a new space this year behind me um, and I know the soil was not great so I planted like bush beans and potatoes why they break up the soil they add nutrients and then um, in the fall I'll just cut all that stuff down and just lay it in the garden and stack leaves over top of it and stack dirt over top of that and I know by and then I'll cover it up and then spring of next year I know that it's going to be really rich soil but I had to start something to get the soil going um, you're not going to have the luxury of just a bunch of people bringing like manure and 
compost and everything to your home, that can get very expensive, especially if you plant big gardens. But with gardens, what are you going to do with the food once you got it? Are you going to freeze it? Well, I, I freeze a lot of things, but canning is probably the best, your best option. Dehydrating or freeze drying. Freeze drying is very expensive to get started on, but dehydrating many things is a good idea too. Um, learn how to preserve food. You have to. Uh, learn how to hunt. Now you say, well, I'm a vegetarian, I'm not going to hunt. Well, you'll be hard pressed to be able to grow a lot of your protein that you need, okay? Especially if you live in a climate like I live in. Um, a, pro a lot of the protein and carbs we're going to find is in meat. And a lot of home studying has to do with meat. Now keep in mind, I don't grow everything that I need. Um, I'm just not that person. I don't have the time to run, you know, a hundred acre garden for a family of four and my mother-in-law and my grandmother-in-law so a family of six I, I just don't have the the energy to be able to do all that I want to enjoy my life so there's um, just maybe a hundred feet down the road for me is an organic farm um, I buy my wheat from them like wheat flour from them I buy my regular flour from them I get my rice from them um, I'm gonna be ordering some other things from them they have a little store right up the street where they sell all this stuff um, like I'm talking in 50 pound bags not small portions or anything right up the road this way uh, there's a, um, a few farms there's like four farms um, I get things like you know green beans green peppers all kinds of stuff from them really cheap like farm market prices um, and they do like an honor system you go in you put cash in the box you take what you need and you go um, then right up the road from there is a farming co-op. They handle meats and vegetables and fruits and all kinds of different wines and jellies and everything. It's very inexpensive. So one of the things that I thought about when I put myself in this location is, um, first and foremost, the ease of growing or getting food. And that had to do with hunting. That had to do with fishing. There's a huge conserv conservancy lake right up the road, Trout Lake. Um, I can hunt up there too. There's geese, there's turkey, there's deer. Um, I can trap up there. Um, right here I can hunt and trap. Um, the farms in the area, there's cattle, there's pork, there's um, you know uh, poultry, there's vegetables, there's fruits, all kinds of different things. And it's all really inexpensive and the neighbors are extremely nice. They're all my neighbors, right? So I can literally, for cheaper than it costs to prep a large space for a garden to be able to grow all those things and the time that I put into it because time is expensive to me um, I can just go and buy quite a few bushels of everything that I need and just can the stuff um, I'm growing to show my children how to be self-sustainable how to be self-reliant like the peach trees and things cherry trees that I have and the blueberry bushes and the raspberries and the blackberries and the the beans and the potatoes and the radishes and the walking onions and things many of the things that I plant grow back next year some of the things don't but they provide me with seeds where I can regrow next year right everything else I, I purchase from local farmers but I have the ability to grow here if I needed to okay um, we have we get about six or seven hundred pounds of apples every year many different varieties like three or four different varieties um, then my neighbors they do a lot of hunting and when I say a lot of hunting they don't hunt here all the time they go all over the place and they hunt all the time my freezer my one freezer big chest freezer was filled with venison last year that I did not shoot <laughs> just, people just give it to me because they know we eat it um, and I just asked for the ground meat I don't even want the other stuff because I can mix it with tacos and all kinds of different things so when we're doing this kind of thing we really I really put a lot of thought into I want that life but I don't want to uh, struggle and be burned out all the time by it um, but I have skills I grew up with skills fencing building buildings raising animals growing food uh, being able to repair things being mechanical and being able to fix my own cars and everything and actually one of the biggest things that I, I learned very young to do is uh, even if you got old stuff if it's if it's still as good as the new stuff you would buy why the hell would you got to go buy the new stuff right use your old stuff and keep take care of it and keep it fixed um, learn how to do your own brakes, shocks, 
uh, rotors, uh, wheel bearings, uh, tie rod ends, and oil changes and tune-ups. Why? Because that stuff breaks on cars more than anything else, right? Learn how to do small engine repair for your, your equipment and everything. Uh, if you don't know how to do these things, you need to look up how to do these things. Find some repair manuals and those types of things. Download them and print them out. Um, don't keep them on devices. Keep them printed and on your bookshelf so you know exactly where they're at. You need repair manuals for everything. You need DIY manuals if you don't know how to do this stuff. But most importantly, the one thing I could really tell, I, I can't say I'm a new homesteader. I've just been, I was raised this way. Go stay with somebody if you know somebody that's done it or you know a community of homesteaders that are having a class like in the arkansas ozarks i know there's a big homesteading community where they each buy like in a co-op like an acre to five acres of land and uh they have like atv trails and a community garden and all kinds of stuff go to classes go to homesteading classes i'm going to be having some homesteading classes here soon and prepping classes uh, but my form of preparedness is living your everyday life and not preparing for the end of the world world without rule of law it's for the things that we faced and the things that we continue to face like natural disasters and economic downturns and things like that those things are actually very easy to prepare for and in a homesteading lifestyle which is simple um, and you're reducing your overhead, you're reducing your dependency on a lot of different things, um, you are increasing your need to be available and to work and to know how to do a lot of things at the same time. And people say, well, how can I learn all this stuff? It's really scary. You learn as you do it. <laughs> you gotta, like, sometimes you just gotta bite the bullet. Uh, what makes most homesteaders I've met fail and give up is indecisiveness. You have to be able to make a decision like that in everything in life. You got to stop overanalyzing everything and stop worrying about what everybody else thinks and just go do what you know you need to do. Um, if you don't have the money or the means to do something, to fix something, to build something, whatever, you got to get creative. Uh, there's a like the uh, outbuilding I'm building for the uh, latrine. Uh, it's old pallets and some logs I'm cutting up. I'm not getting fancy. I'm not going out and buying material to build that thing. It's a hole in the ground that people are going to poop in. I'm just not going to do it. The truth about homesteading is it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of de dedication. It takes kind of a stoic mindset um, to deal with some of the everyday challenges, which there are everyday challenges. Um, and it is um, something that's going to test your might. It, it really will um, and it will challenge you psychologically every single day but I don't the outside world doesn't affect me all that much not really um, yeah there's property taxes and things like that you consider those things but at the end of the day as long as the millage is paid the outside world doesn't affect me all that much what's going on out there so but you have to understand that I'm established. So if you're starting now, I'd suggest that you start small and work your way up. And one of the best ways, this is the biggest tip I can give anybody, if you're going to buy property as a homestead, make sure there's many like other lots or acreage adjoining to your property around you that's also for sale and that has been for sale for like a long time. Because as you grow, um, and do certain things, you might be able to buy that other chunk of land that adjoins to your property. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, that's how my grandfather started his farm. He had over 46,000 acres, mostly hay fields. And he got that because every year he bought the place across the street. He bought this place over here. He bought this place down there. And it was really cheap land. Nobody wanted it for anything because it was back in the hills and everything. But for him, it was fantastic because he bailed hay for a living. That was kind of his thing, raised cattle and bailed hay. Um, me, the only animals I'm raising here are chickens. I don't need a lot of property to raise chickens. And they're just for eggs, really. Um, that's the only reason I'm really raising them um, and to show the kids how to do it. Um, but other than that, you know, I don't raise cattle. I can buy cattle from one of the farms and have it butchered by the butcher up the road or butcher it myself, which I don't want to do. Um, meat here is fairly inexpensive when it comes to livestock uh, locally. So I don't really get concerned about that. 
but if you can buy a place that has adjoining properties that are for sale and have been for a while like raw untouched land and stuff like that you can buy up properties and connect it to yours as you grow if you want to but i suggest that most people start with no more than five acres and i'd want half at least half of that to be wooded why well and a lot of and make sure there's water a lot of wooded areas do have water most wooded areas have a wildlife um, most wooded areas have wood it's just something critical for homesteading your alternative source of heat or your primary source of heat um, plus if you get a piece of property that has a lot of straight standing hardwoods you can have a selective tree service come in and they'll selectively harvest lumber and you can make that money back I've seen plenty, I know plenty of people, and I've done it myself in the past. You buy uh, 100 acres or so of property, which is a lot, just so you know, it is a lot. Um, and there's a lot of standing black walnut and oak and maple that was beautiful. And um, there's plenty of saplings all over the place and a lot of crooked ones that nobody would want. So I sold all the big ones and I paid for the land from the, the uh, lumber sales. So you'd be surprised. Um, so you really want to do your homework. Um, finally, the truth about homesteading is, is um, take your time to choose the piece of land that you want um, by looking at least, I would go and look at at least 30 to 50 properties. And that might seem like a lot, um, but try to find a place where homesteading is or raw land is widely available and there's not a lot of rules for building stuff and everything. Like here, there's a couple rules getting permits of building out buildings and stuff, but other than that, this this township doesn't really bother you. The county doesn't really bother you or anything. So I don't really get too concerned about anything. Um, we don't have public you know, sewage and stuff going down through or public water or anything, uh, which is fine with me. I don't want it. And uh, my house sets too far back from the road anyway, so if they did run it down through here, I wouldn't have to get it because I have my own water supply and I'm too far away from the road for them to want to run sewage or anything. So I, I don't get concerned about that. The truth about homesteading is uh, it takes money to start up. I, I mean, that's you're not, you're not going to jump onto a piece of land, set up a tent, and live there for a couple years until you get started without suffering a bit, without really, really... Um, um, let's say sacrificing quite a bit. Uh, you won't get started without any tools. Rakes, steel rakes, uh, like leaf rakes, steel rakes, hoes, axes. Um, axes aren't as important unless you're felling trees with an axe as much as splitting malls, wedges, and even a log splitter. So even a small $300 electric five-ton log splitter will help you do more than you could do by swinging a maul all day. Um, Gas storage, fuel storage, uh, water storage, um, the ability to build. If you don't have that, then, and I'm talking basic carpentry, electrical, uh, water, plumbing, and uh, structural, um, and mechanical. Having those skills, having the tools that helps you complete those skills, but don't buy a bunch of stuff all at once. Um, buy it as you go. And a lot of times you can hit a flea market, garage sales, and estate sales, and pl things like that. And you can find old hammerheads and sledgehammer heads and old mauls and hoes and rakes and shovels. Shovels are extremely important. Uh, flat shovels. Um, if you're going to raise animals, you need shovels for stalls, big scoop, you know, aluminum shovels, um, snow shovels, <laughs> you know, um, spades. So... You can buy a lot of that stuff at flea market and stuff for a few bucks. Like literally, you can buy them dirt cheap. You know, uh, but you don't you don't get everything at once. Just get your basic yard tools taken care of, um, and get your basic mechanic tools taken care of. Your basic carpentry tools, and a lot of these things cross over, right? So some tools you're going to use in multiple areas, and basic plumbing tools and electrical tools can be pretty good to start with. Start with building a small outbuilding. Um, don't start with building a house. Learn how to build structurally. Um, take some classes if you can. If somebody asked me what's the most important thing to invest in when it comes to home studying or self-reliance or the, the many types of things I do, especially on this channel. It's education, information. That's the best thing you can possibly invest in. Um, I've had people lately a lot calling me up to ask me to train them and stuff, and uh, there's a reason for it. 
and people are seeing the writing on the wall and quite honestly what they learned from me they won't learn from a lot of books and stuff it would take them forever to find all those books to learn the things they need to learn uh, feel free, free to reach out if you have a budget and you can afford the, the mentoring I'd, I'd be more than happy to we can do it remotely it's not a big deal but homes the truth about homesteading is it's a different way of life and you need to change your mindset about what everyday living looks like and realize there's no right or wrong way to homestead everybody has their own unique approach to it that's the beauty of it all right take care